Hi there. Last week, we learned all about how climate change is affecting the unique Arctic environment. One way that climate change is altering the region is that it's making it easier to travel to and access natural resources. This video will give you an overview of all the economic interests in the Arctic and will cover industries such as energy, fishing, shipping, and tourism. Before we start talking economics, it's important here that we first discuss the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea that was signed in 1982. The Law of the Sea is described as a constitution for the oceans and aims to codify international law regarding territorial waters, sea lanes, and ocean resources. According to the 1982 convention, each country's sovereign territorial waters extend to a maximum of 12 nautical miles or 22 kilometers beyond its coast, but foreign vessels are granted the right of innocent passage through this zone. Beyond its territorial waters, every coastal country may establish an Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, extending 200 nautical miles, or about 370 kilometers from shore. Within the EEZ, the coastal state has the right to exploit and regulate fisheries, construct artificial islands and installations, or use the zone for other economic purposes, and regulate scientific research by foreign vessels. With regard to the seabed beyond territorial waters, every coastal country has exclusive rights to the oil, gas, and other resources in the seabed up to 200 nautical miles from shore or to the outer edge of the continental margin. Legally, this area is known as the Continental Shelf, where the territorial waters, EEZs, or continental shelves of neighboring countries overlap, a boundary line must be drawn by agreement to achieve an equitable solution. The high seas lie beyond the zones described above. The waters and airspace of this area are open to use by all countries except for those activities prohibited by international law, such as the testing of nuclear weapons. The bed of the high seas is known as the International Seabed Area, for which the 1982 Convention established a separate and detailed legal regime. Because of opposition from some countries, the regime was modified in 1994, and under the modified regime, the minerals on the ocean floor beneath the high seas are deemed the common heritage of mankind, and their exploitation is administered by the International Seabed Authority. Any commercial exploration or mining of the seabed is carried out by private or state concerns, regulated and licensed by the ISA, though thus far only exploration has been carried out. Under international law, no country currently owns the North Pole or the region of the Arctic Ocean surrounding it. The five surrounding Arctic countries, the Russian Federation, the United States, Canada, Norway, and Greenland are limited to an exclusive economic zone adjacent to their coasts. Upon ratification of the Law of the Sea, a country has a 10-year period to make claims to an extended continental shelf, which, if validated, gives its exclusive rights to resources on or below the seabed of that extended shelf area. Norway ratified the convention in 1996, Russia 1997, Canada 2003, and Denmark, Greenland 2004. Each launched project to provide a basis for seabed claims on the extended shelves beyond their exclusive economic zones. The United States has signed, but not yet ratified, the Law of the Sea. According to an assessment conducted by the U.S. Geological Survey, the Arctic holds an estimated 13% or 90 billion barrels of the world's undiscovered conventional oil resources. According to the same USGS assessment, the Arctic holds an estimated 30% or 1.67 trillion cubic feet of undiscovered conventional natural gas resources. About 70% of undiscovered oil and natural gas resources occur in several basins across the Arctic, including Arctic Alaska, Amerisia, East Greenland Rift, East Barents, West Greenland East Canada, and West Siberian Basin. 
A basin is a depression in the crust of the earth caused by plate tectonic activity and subsidence in which sediments accumulate. If rich hydrocarbon source rocks occur in combination with appropriate depth and duration of burial, then a petroleum system can develop within the basin. The North American side of the Arctic is estimated to hold about 65% of the undiscovered oil and 26% of the undiscovered natural gas. Specifically, it is projected that the Alaskan Arctic region holds the largest undiscovered oil deposits, or roughly 30 billion barrels. In 1968, Argo and Standard Oil drilled a well that tapped the largest oil field in North America, the Prudhoe Bay field on Alaska's North Slope. Production began in 1977 after the completion of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez, Alaska. And over time, companies including Shell and BP have successfully found oil. Onshore oil seeps were discovered in the Canadian Arctic in the 18th century. Imperial oil began exploratory drilling in the 20s, which led to the discovery of the Norman Wells Field in the Northwest Territories. Throughout the 40s and 50s, exploration activity increased in the southern portion of the Northwest Territories and eventually moved north of the Arctic Circle to the Mackenzie Delta, Arctic Islands, Sverdrup Basin, and offshore into the Canadian Beaufort in 1972. Activity in the region started to subside in the 80s, but higher energy prices renewed interest in exploration in the region by 2004. Over the last few years, the Russian Federation has intensified the development of vast hydrocarbon resources of its continental shelf through state incentives aimed at stimulating offshore oil and gas production. In fact, in September of 2014, ExxonMobil supposedly struck oil in the Kara Sea, north of Russia. Norway is the world's fifth largest oil exporter and second largest exporter of natural gas. Norwegian oil and gas production is concentrated on the Norwegian continental shelf with activity in the North Sea, the Norwegian Sea, and the Barents Sea. There are several challenges to oil development, including the first, that equipment needs to be specifically designed to withstand frigid temperatures. On Arctic lands, poor soil conditions can require additional site preparation to prevent equipment and structures from sinking. Because of where the Arctic is located, long supply lines and limited transportation access from the world's manufacturing centers require equipment redundancy and a larger inventory of spare parts, while also increasing transportation costs. Employees expect higher wages and salaries to work in the isolated and inhospitable Arctic. Natural gas hydrates can pose operational problems for drilling wells in both onshore and offshore Arctic areas. Natural gas consumers live far away from the region, and transportation costs of natural gas are higher than those for oil and natural gas liquids. Studies on the economics of onshore oil and natural gas projects in Arctic Alaska estimate costs to develop reserves in the region can be 50% to 100% more than similar projects undertaken in Alaska. It's really expensive to develop oil in the Arctic. Along with economic and political challenges, environmental issues including the preservation of animal and plant species unique to the Arctic need to be taken into consideration. Oil spills in the Arctic will be much more difficult to contain and clean up. Arctic waters sustain more than 150 species of fish, including ecologically important populations of Arctic cod, Pacific herring, Pacific sand lance, Arctic flounder, and several types of cisco and whitefish. No commercial fisheries exist on the outer continental shelf north of the Bering Strait at present because sea ice has blocked access. However, the current rate of ice melt due to climate change could soon make the Arctic Ocean more accessible to commercial fishing. The 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, as well as the UN 1995 Fish Stocks Convention, obliged states to co cooperate on resource management in the areas beyond the 200-mile zones. Warming ocean temperatures, migrating fish stocks, and shifting sea ice conditions from a changing climate may potentially favor the development of commercial fisheries. Some Arctic states, like the U.S., are already making plans. For example, in 2009, the United States approved the Fishery Management Plan, which establishes a framework for sustainably managing Arctic marine resources. The plan initially prohibits commercial fishing in the Arctic until more information is available to support sustainable fisheries management. The plan recommends taking a precautionary approach or proposing closing the waters north of the Bering Strait to commercial fishing until or unless scientific research determines that such activities would not harm the ecosystem or local people. 
Because of climate change, the Arctic is becoming more accessible and easier to travel to. There are a number of positive and negative implications to increased tourism. As more people visit the region, they may be more compelled to care about it and be more active in helping it being protected from climate change and overdevelopment. But as more people go up north, wildlife and the natural surroundings become disturbed. The Arctic Marine Tourism Project is part of a renewed effort by the Arctic Council to analyze and promote sustainable tourism across the circumpolar Arctic. The overall objective is to provide guidance to a range of Arctic stakeholders on means to strengthen and promote sustainable Arctic marine tourism. The Arctic Council recommends tourism that minimizes negative impacts and maximizes social, cultural, environmental, and economic benefits for residents of the Arctic. The World Wildlife Foundation outlines 10 principles for Arctic tourism. Make tourism and conservation compatible. Support the preservation of wilderness and biodiversity. Use natural resources in a sustainable way. Minimize consumption, waste, and pollution. Respect local cultures, historic, and scientific sites. Make sure that Arctic communities benefit from tourism. Be sure that trains that staff are well trained. Make sure that tourists learn as much as they can about the Arctic and follow all safety rules. Climate change and receding sea ice might make navigation through the Arctic more viable. Some shipping companies are interested in these Arctic routes because of possible savings of cost and time. Some of these Arctic routes include the Northern Sea Route, which goes along the northernmost coast of Russia. Many agree that this route is likely to be the first that will be free of ice and will cut down on the journey between Asia and Russia by about 21,000 kilometers. The Northwest Passage is along the Canadian Arctic through islands in Nunavut. The passage is roughly 13,600 kilometers between Asia and Europe, compared to a 24,000 kilometer journey through the Panama Canal. The Arctic Bridge links Murmansk, Russia, or Narvik, a Norwegian port, to a port in Canada called Churchill. The last route is a hypothetical route as it involves total ice-free conditions. The Transpolar Sea Route cuts straight through the middle of the Arctic Circle linking the Bering Strait to Russia. I hope this video gave you a good start to understanding just how complex the economic picture of the Arctic is. Energy, fishing, tourism, and shipping are just some possibilities for the future. And scientists, researchers, and government officials from coastal Arctic states and non-Arctic states are not really sure about the extent of future development. It is encouraged to think outside of more predominant and 20th century narratives of the Arctic and look at the Arctic through a more 21st century lens, perhaps one that focuses on more sustainable ideas like renewable energy, telecommunications, and data, and ensure that development of the Arctic is done by the people of the Arctic for the people of the Arctic.